Well, hello and welcome to Urban Life Church Online. We are so glad that you decided to join us today. It is a beautiful day. The sun is out. It's toasty here in Midran. And we're excited for all that God has in store for us today. We're believing for the manifest presence of God to fill your home right now, to fill your car, wherever you might be. We are trusting for the undeniable presence of God and an unprecedented moment to take place in your life this morning. So stick around, follow us. You are in for a treat this morning. Come on. I am here with Marcy. We're so excited. It's been a good morning. I'll start by how I got to the church. Yeah. I've been searching for a place where I'll feel welcome, I'll feel at home, yeah. and I'll feel there's a sense of belonging. And I came to Urban Life and I found that exactly. And I started at starting point and I got to learn more about my relationship with God. And today, I, got, I took the opportunity to be saved and be born again. Come on, he literally, I saw you step forward, you went and put a light bulb in, and then the next thing you were getting baptized. I was quite in a very dark place, alone, battling a relationship with God, thinking that, am I enough for the Lord? But today I've, I found that no, I am enough for the Lord. Come on, you are more than enough. Oh, this is so beautiful. And we're trusting that every time you look at these flowers, you're going to be reminded that you are more than enough and that God loves you so very much. And we're excited to see the desert bloom. We're with you and we're part of the story with you. So welcome to Urban Life. Thank we are so, so excited to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So I'm here with Yogami and you just had an incredible morning. I mean, you arrived here early, as far as I know. Yes. You were serving. Yes. You were like, I'm not a Christian. Well, I had a call in to come to church. And this was the first church I found closest to me. Okay. And I felt very welcome this morning. I felt very loved. Uh, the community is amazing, uh, very vibrant. The energy is very vibrant. And getting into the church and singing and just enjoying. Uh, the words. Yeah, yeah I, I just feel love. I just feel love all, all over me right now. And this moment that with the flowers, how is that? Have you found yourself in a difficult or feeling like you're in a dry space? Uh, I have been very stuck and in a dry place. And I could feel the growth coming back. You know? uh, especially with the two flowers. There's a breakthrough in my heart. The light, I know I have a light and I have love. And it's growing, it's growing. Beautiful. Yeah. We're so excited. That's a beautiful, exciting morning for you. We're always celebrating. But I think just to see you take a step forward and then put in a light bulb. The flowers are shining, they're bright and beautiful, but I think God sent something in your heart and yeah. I can't wait to see what unfolds from here. So we're celebrating with you. This Thank you so much. I feel so welcome. Thank you so much. Amazing. So I'm here with Alex and Karen. This is your last Sunday at Urban Life Church. It is. How is it feeling? Uh, tough. <laughs> tough. Tough but appreciative. Yeah. It's tough to say goodbye to everybody, but it's wow for what we've been part of yeah. here, being part of everybody, the growth, the people, the lives, and just belonging to Urban Life is yeah. so wonderful and we're so blessed by Yeah, it. I mean, you've been a part of Urban Life for 14 years. I think one thing from us is we just want to honor you. We want to say thank you for sowing into people's lives. I mean, I've had conversations with you as well. I've just said, Karen, I just need someone to talk to, you know, and you guys are always available and you're welcoming. And I think the seeds you've sown, you haven't even begun to see what God is going to do with them. So I just want to honor you and say, well done. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you because thank you really have been a gift to Urban Life. And we're excited for your next. We're excited. I mean, retirement. Amazing. Um, but we're excited to see where you get connected and, and what God continues to do through you. I think what I want to charge Urban Life with more than anything is what Craig charged us all with at the beginning of the year. And that is that we need to add life to our years. Mm. And as you get older, it's important. We need life. We need life in our years. We need to live our years. We need to love our years. We need to give into our years to be able to give out and fill and pour out into the lives of others because life is so important and we can give so much but we also need people behind us who've given into our lives and thank you urban life for always being there always doing that and enabling us 
to become what we have become because of you. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, the word is growth. What I've been seeing over the years in the past few months is just expansion. It's either going to be more services or yeah. expand it's buildings. It's a community. It's a place where people can come and be safe. Yeah. There's a new chapter coming. So. The end. <laughs> Anyone been sorrowing and sighing? I believe that God wants to do something miraculous. If I can have those lights up just a little bit, guys, because I'm going to ask you, if that's you, you have a desert place that needs to blossom. And it could be in the place of um, healing. You, you, you're sick. Or in your finances. Maybe in conceiving. You're battling to be fruitful. You're depressed or in your workplace, a relationship, marriage. I want you, right where you are now, to make your way out and come stand in the front here because I believe that God wants to minister to you. God wants to bring strength and courage right into those dry places. So if I can just ask you to come and stand in the front, make way, make space. Brilliant. Come on. Come on out. Don't worry about what people think. Come and stand in here. Come on. Make way. Maybe you've got to come right forward, guys, because people are going to come in behind you. Are you ready? Give them some space. Let them come there. Woo! All right. Now we're talking. Come around there. Uh, uh, these, these guys, move away. Or can I ask you three guys to make way and go and help? Oh, Jesus, would you multiply? So as we sought the Lord, and He answered us, and I, I'm just telling you, we were praying, and I prayed, and I just saw flowers. I just saw flowers. And so I thought, I said to Sabella, I said, would you go down south of town and buy as many flowers as we can that will fit in the van, in which he did. But I'm not even sure we got enough. So if you're a husband and wife, will you take one? Right. I want to give you flowers today. Are you ready? Men, are you ready to get some flowers? And don't forget, this is not about love. This is about a declaration from heaven speaking blossoming into those parched and desolate places. Come on. Come on up. Give them out. Give them out. Come on. We serve the Lord. You're the change of God. out yet. I play multiplication. Father, can you multiply flowers? You did bread. Can we do flowers? Wow. All right. Here we coming. Here we coming. Here we coming. I got at least 60 bunches. But then maybe here we go. Here's a man. Huh? Sabella is at the shops. Here we go. Father, you can multiply bread. You can multiply flowers. Who hasn't got? Whoa. I thought it was dropping. Who hasn't got? Here we go. Men, did you think you were going to get flowers at church today? Are you missing out, Kia? You guys are here. You're part of the family. Let me hold back. Something significant is going to happen and break in our place today. So let me just see how we do. Are we done? Finished. All right. Okay. Who hasn't got flowers? If you single by your fellow. Right. I want you, if you're anywhere near there, can, can you, even if you just took one out, just take one out and give it to someone else. Come on, multiply your flowers. That's it. Take one or two and just go. There's people all over. Come on, let's say, God's, your desert's going to blossom. Your desert's going to blossom. 
Your desert's going to blossom. Your desert's going to blossom. Come on, we got to... There we go. There we go. There we go. Come on. You were given, now give freely. I want everyone. That's it. Just give. That's it. This is a desert place. We even sent Sabella to the shop to buy more. <laughs> Who hasn't got? Who hasn't got? There, there we go. There's still hands up there. Can you help there? Come, there's a whole lot behind you there. There's a whole lot behind you. Friends, don't worry. This is going to be a prophetic declaration. Come on, share. Anyone else here? Who hasn't got? Everybody. Who are we going to share? Share, share, share. Oh. You got him? All right. Now, in that bunch of flowers, and maybe you didn't get, but we'll get some more, is a paper. It's actually just the Word of God, and you can get that in Isaiah chapter 35. It's this chapter that God spoke to us out of. This is a declaration. So I want you to take your flowers home, and I want you to put it in a very prominent place, whether it's where you make up your face or whether you come into your house or whether you at your office at your desk I want you to put them in there even if it's one and I want you to put this there so that every time you see it I want you to stop and begin to declare that the barren places the desert places are going to start to blossom they're going to come to fruitfulness that your body is going to be healed That your marriage is going to come to healing. You're going to begin to declare that. We're going to pray now. But I want you to have faith. This is what God sent me to say to you. Are you ready? All right. So where did I steal that one from? Now, if you didn't get at the end at your info hub afterwards, you'll be able to pick up your bunch. Hopefully. Where is that? Isaiah 35. All right. Let's hold up our, our, our flowers. All of those of you who've got it. Those of you, even if you like, hey, I wanted flowers, but I didn't. I didn't get, but yeah, come hold them up. I'm holding up mine. Prophetically, I'm going to proclaim. Are you ready? Father, you sent me to proclaim strength and courage to your people. Those that are weak knees and weak hands. They've dropped their hands. They're not praising you. There is those that, God, you want to encourage that are anxious, that are stressing this morning. And so we proclaim this. We proclaim your word that the desert places, the parched lands, would be filled with pools. That healing would come right now. Healing to bodies. Healing to marriages. Lord, we pray right now that businesses would come to begin to blossom. Contracts would come. Right now, we're proclaiming it in the name of our precious Jesus Christ. And amen and amen. All right. Now, I want you to stay here because I want you to sing. Isaiah 35 finishes with that. Let the redeemed of the Lord, as they return, will come singing, all right? And if I get a chance, I'll preach about it. If I don't, we're just going to worship. Is that all right? All right. Are you going to sing? Because singing is going to break that praise is going to come and begin to move God's hand. Praise and worship and singing is going to bring the rivers to flow into those parts of land. Go. Go, go, go.
Urban Life. My name is Craig. What a privilege and honor it is to be with you this morning. I want you to go back with your flowers. Uh, we don't just want to pray once. We want to be a people of prayer that focus ourselves on that. So for the next six weeks in our meetings, we will be praying for the election. Not just our nation, but we're praying for the election and that God would come in his grace and mercy and visit us again. Um, and so, uh, would you come prepared with that? Uh, we will continue to script the prayer, and you can get it. We'll probably we'll try and put it up on our on the church center app, so you can access it. Uh, just to warn, and just to go, the last 21 days before the election, we as a church are going to get praying together um, every day. We will have a prayer focus that we can all come into unity and agreement every day, 21 days before, that we would pray together as a people. We may not be together, though we will have one or two of those events before the election. We want to do that. And so we're going to gear up six weeks. We're trusting and believing that we are joining the people of God right around our nation in praying for this election this year. Um, also to say that there is a gathering to pray at in Bryanston, New, New Covenant or NCCB Bryanston on the 1st of May. Um, that is across in Bryanston. It is open for everybody. They're calling the churches um, from the city to go. And you can get information about that. Um, let us pray in CCB. If you need to know any more information, um, you can um, get it at the Info Hub. I encourage you to, to get part of that, go across. There's going to be um, thousands of people gathering together to pray for our nation. There are others that are taking place in Pretoria, Centurion, and around. Um, pick one, go to it. But as a church, can I ask us to join together in unity and harmony with one another in praying uh, for our beautiful nation? Amen? And then it, is a, it was a, a grand weekend because we did starting point, Wanga and I, uh, this last weekend. Um, Andy was there on Friday night. Some others were also. Uh, we don't normally do it. So it's normally uh, Warren and Lauren, they were on holiday, so they asked us to do it. Uh, please don't tell them we didn't stay on the script at all. Uh, we just did our own thing. But it was great to have over 20 people um, saying that they want to put their feet in the city gates of Urban Life. And if you're here this morning, we want to say thank you and welcome to Urban Life. Uh, we are trusting that your time here would be a time of great fruitfulness and an explosion in maturity. But it's also today a day where we say uh, a farewell to an amazing couple, Alex and Karen One. Um, you see him, if you sit behind, the he's normally in the second row, you would see his shiny head. Um, uh, but Alex and Karen, I want you to do is, why don't you just come and stand up here? Um, and my phone is inside there, love, in my, my pocket. Um, and let's just give them a big round of applause. I want you to stand over here. And I want you to face me, oh, okay, I want you to face me, because Andy and I have been going like, what? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, what could we give you uh, as a piece of urban life? <laughs> and we go like, and I thought, um, should I give him my Bible? What should we do? But, uh, and uh, what we want to do is we want to take a photograph of you with this beautiful community behind you so you can take a little bit. Uh, how are we going to do this? All right, everybody, are you going to wave? You're going to do something? Um, I, need, I, need a better, I, mean, I need a better photographer. Yo, let's stand. Come on. And I need some of the friends around them. Come on quickly. Um, are we going to try this? Everybody go, whoa, or something like that. You know, um, and uh, how do you do? There we go. Wait, there we go. All right, everybody, we're just going to stand still now. Well, let's see if that works, all right? Unscripted. Unscripted. Um, just stand. Now you can turn around. And so this couple is retiring. They're going down the south coast. They've been 14 years in urban life. They have served us so well. And 
They become personal friends with Andy and I. We had dinner with them the other evening. And uh, we just want to say thank you so much. They have labored amongst us with, how many of you are here that has been in their counseling for pre-engagement, pre-marriage counseling, all of that? If you're here, you can just wave, there's Benny. Um, and so that's what they've done over many years, served us, served our families. And uh, we want to say thank you and God bless you. Father, I ask that as they go, that we send them with your good grace, Amen. that they would find a home that uh, is, will not be like urban life, but will be a fit perfectly for them and them for, for the church, and that you would continue to bless them and bless the South Coast in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, give them a big hand. Um, we can uh, uh, give them a hug and uh, bid them farewell afterwards. And Father, I'm asking this morning that you would just, as you have presenced yourself with us, that you would be undeniably here in each one and in everyone, but that you would do something so significant this morning that would explode in, a, in an eruption of praise and honor and glory and majesty to you. Asking this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week I spoke a message, um, a better way to worship, and I was told I wasn't allowed to say that I would have uh, part two. Because whenever I say I'm going to do part two, I never do it. So I didn't say, but he has part two, okay? <laughs> um, we are looking at a better way, and that's not just another way. It's not just any way, it is a kingdom way, it is a God way, it is a highway of holiness, it is a highway to the presence of God, a better way. And last week, just to catch you up, uh, we spoke about a better way to worship, and we looked at the Garden of Eden, where God comes, and He is the temple in the garden. He is manifest, real, and there. There is, uh, Adam and Eve have absolute um, access. Anytime, anywhere, anyway. God was in the Garden of Eden. There was no barrier. There was no, nothing between them. In fact, we could say that he was the temple. He was the house. He was the home. He was the worship house right there. Tangible, visible with them. But of course, we also know that then Adam and Eve, mankind, rebelled against God and took, uh, 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 rebelled. And then God had to come in his mercy and grace. He doesn't abandon mankind. He doesn't sort of like, okay, Adam and Eve, sweep you away, let's start again. He says, no, what I'll do is I'm going to lock you out of the garden. I'm locking you out of my temple. I'm locking you out of the manifest presence, the, the, the being there in, 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 in that beautiful way. Um, and he put an angel with a sword and fire to shut them out. But then he showed them a way back into his presence. And he took an animal and he slaughtered that animal and blood flowed. And he put that animal and he took the skin when he made clothing for them as a picture. And he was preaching the gospel to them to say that one day everything will be restored. And that in between that being locked out, well, let me say, being in this Garden of Eden, you're saying there'll be one day a garden city when everything will be made right again and you'll have complete access. And, and the beautiful thing about the Bible, and we want to have um, a whole Bible theology, um, that's what we strive to do. Sometimes I take a long time to tell a story, and, um, but it's to be able to give us context because I want us to understand that we need to have a whole Bible theology, Genesis to Revelation. And, and the beauty about this and having the Word of God is this, is that we can read the beginning of the story. Hey, but we can read the end of the story as well. And we know how it's going to end. God hasn't left us in the dark not knowing how it's going to end. 
We know how it started in this most incredible, beautiful, fruitful, amazing garden of Eden with absolute access to God who is the temple, the, the home, the Father in perfection. And we all are partakers of the fallen nature of man and this difficult season whereby we have, in a way, locked out of that Garden of Eden. But now we can also see, how will it end? Because God doesn't leave us without hope. He gives us hope. And so in Revelation chapter 21, we see that just how um, this is a great picture. Um, I'm not sure if I gave you these scriptures Santana, so whether they'll come up, but uh, Revelation 21, it says, and there came one of the seven angels with the seven bowls full of the, of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God having the glory of God, its radiance like the most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall, 12 gates, gates, 12 angels, and so forth. If you go to verse 17, he said he measured this, and there's this massive city. Um, go down to verse 22, and it says this, and I saw no temple in the city. Did, did I? Oh, it's not there. All right. <laughs> You know what, Prince? This is the picture of when God has restored all things, and now the new Jerusalem has come down, the new garden city, the Garden of Eden, in a way, has now been restored to the whole world, and there is no temple there. Say no temple there. There'll be no need for a church and a building. This will pass away. This won't be anymore. We get to enjoy it here. Like this. It's going to be completely different. There is no temple. Now that is for generations of thousands of years. Because when mankind was shut out of Eden, God set into place a process of a better way to worship or how to worship. And it ends in this idyllic city, garden city, where there is no temple. Why? Let's read it. For its temple is the Lord God and Almighty the Lamb. He is the temple. He is our temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon or shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. And by its light all the nations will walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. And, and this, is, this, is, this is when I really get excited, because I go like, one day we're going to be in this garden city. But there was this process that God, I believe when he took that animal, sacrificed it, took the skin, made clothing, did an, an, uh, an offering, a sacrifice, and told Adam and Eve, he's saying, listen, the blood of animals, which is the fruit of the soil of the land, though the sand, the soil is cursed, that which is planted in the, in the soil, the fruit of the soil will be given as sacrifice, and the blood of bulls or the blood of animals will take away the sin so that you can enter into my presence again. You have full access through the sacrifice of blood, which is life, isn't it? And so we saw last week in chapter 4 of Genesis that two boys, Adam and Eve's two sons, they bring two sacrifices in two very different ways. One is accepted, one isn't. And you can go back. Sorry, the recording is terrible. We've, have you guys made sure that the recording this week is good? Uh, please check. Um, but you can go back and listen. But this was the first offering given that is recorded in Scripture of how they would bring the first fruits, the first, the firstborn, the first things, the first out of the soil 
Why was that so important? Because God was going to give his firstborn. God was going to come in the form of man and God, Emmanuel here on earth, and he would give himself as a sacrifice. From that moment on, there would be no need for any more uh, blood sacrifices. So for thousands of years, animals were sacrificed so that Men and women could enter the presence of God. Now, the goal was never the sacrifice, friends. The goal was never the sacrifice. You know, when we, there's a complex issue that needs a simple solution. When you read Leviticus, man, those, those sacrifices are really quite complex, isn't it? And we can get stuck in the complexity. The sacrifice was never the issue was never the goal, sorry. The sacrifice was never the goal. The goal was the intimacy after the sacrifice. So what happens is God comes and then he establishes a Levitical form of worship. When we say Levitical, it is because he chose the, the tribe of Levi, and we can read that in Leviticus 1, 2, 3, 4, sets out this Levitical form of of sacrifices, burnt offerings, meal offerings, and so. These were all so that men and women could come through the sacrifice of blood, life-giving, and into the presence of God, into the manifest presence of God. And God, in that moment, dwelt in a covenant chest. It's called the Ark of the Testament, the Ark of the Covenant. God made a covenant with his people, Israel, and he came in his manifest presence and dwelt in the cherubim. So in this ark, there were cherubims, great beings made out of gold that were on the top of this chest. And it says that God dwelt amongst the cherubims. This almighty God manifest himself in power and authority right there. And it was put into a tent, into a temporary dwelling because it was a picture that one day there would be a permanent dwelling, and one day it would look that it would no longer need a tent or a building, but it will be fulfilled in a person, the Lamb. And so in this temporary tent, Moses set up this Levitical form of worship, and they put it into a holy of holies, a kind of set-apart room, and then a courts, and then there was this elaborate uh, building, all of which I don't have time to go in, but all is rich in, in, in metaphors and pictures to help us understand how worship is in heaven. It was an exact lep- replica, as in heaven it was on earth. And so for years and years, hundreds of years, they would come to this tent They would sacrifice animals, and they would experience the presence of God just like you and me can right now. The Israelite worship and the Levitical worship was no no less passionate, no less real than you and I have today. We are no special people. We are not got a better time. You know, I always used to think, thank God I was born after Jesus. Anybody else think that? It's like, uh, let me tell you, that it didn't matter. We could experience God today just like they could experience God in that day. In fact, I think in some ways, they saw God way better than we did. Because there was a building, there was a tent, there was God there, and there was smoke and fire, and there was a manifestation of God right in their eyes, something visible. But what happened over time, if you look at the history, as you go through the history books of, of, of the Bible, they came into a promised land. The ark of God went before them. The ark of God and his presence drove the enemies away and gave them a land of milk and honey, a promised land. And they dwelt in that land, but they forgot about God. They forgot about the sacrifices. They forgot about worshiping God. And so God was delegated to a place in Shiloh. That's where the tent or this temporary temple was. 
And it began to fall into a lot of disrepute. In fact, the, when you read Samuel, you'll see that Samuel and his sons were very corrupt. His sons were very bad. Bad, bad, bad. And God was withdrawing his protection from them. And the Philistines, the enemy comes and attacks them. Can I just get some water there, please? Attacks them. They are defeated. And what happens? Thanks, my love. They are defeated. And what they do is they go like, man, maybe if we take the ark of God into battle, we will win. And you can read that in 1, in 1 Samuel chapter um, 6, I think it is. No, no. 1 Samuel chapter 5, 4, 5. You'll read that story. And it says, and the people of Israel, the people of Israel, went into this temple, took the Ark of Covenant out of it, and took it into battle as like a lucky charm. We can also do that, I think, in our day, don't we? We take God's name and just use it in vain like a lucky charm. In Jesus' name. And we don't understand, really, the power and the manifest presence of who we're talking about. And they thought if they just took this lucky charm into battle, they'd win. But unfortunately, the Philistines beat them and captured the ark. And so this presence of God, worship was collapsing right there in Israel. Goes into the Philistines, but the Philistines, just, it just loose, there's havoc that gets loosed in, in the Philistines. The gods are falling, tumors, people are getting sick, infertility. They was just, eventually they go like, we've had enough, we can't take this thing, send it back. So they get some new cows and heifers and so forth and a, a new cart and they just send it back to Israel. And Israel sees the ark coming and they start rejoicing and they take this uh, ox cart that has uh, uh, brought the ark back and they make wood and they, they sacrifice uh, the animals and they worship there and they disrespect God and they go, like, I want to see what's inside here. And some oaks lifted the, the, the ark of God and 70 of them died right there. And so the guys are going like, whoa, that casually, you know what? There's so much in you. I've just got to keep going. I want to give you context, all right? And so they go, no, we can't do this. 1 Samuel 17, uh, 1 Samuel 7, you'll see, they, they call the people of Kirith Jerim, who are the forest people, and they say they, it's high, they got a high place, and they say, you guys come and take the ark. So they come and take it, and they put it in Abinadab's house, and they take his son to be. Um, his son's name is Eliezer, and they make him the keeper of the ark. And I, I'll read this to you, and it says, And the men of Kirith Jerim came and took up the ark and the Lord and brought it to his house, Abinadab, on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eliezer to, charge, to, be charged, to have charge over the ark of the Lord. And from that day, the ark was lodged in Kirith Jerim, and a long time passed. Say a long time. I remember God speaking to me out of this verse because Abinadab means when the father is willing. My father is willing. Eliezer means um, God has helped. Eza, God has helped. And uh, El Eza, that's how it's El Eza. The Lord God Almighty has helped. And God said to me, is this, if the fathers are willing... And the young men and the young people will look to him for his help. God's presence will stay here for a very long time. And when I begin to see how many older fathers are here and the young people, it's like this is, this is the home. This could this be Abinadab's home, that we as older people will never get insecure with how God is helping our young people. Could we never be, uh, uh, get insecure and, and worry about uh, younger preachers coming through the mash and the, and, 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 the, and the Warrens and everyone else, and we want to see ladies and, and young people coming through that will say, God help me. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God's presence will be here for a very long time. And so the t this ark stayed in, in this Abinadab's house for a long time. And then as you see history unfolds, 
There's chaos in the land. They want a king. They get a king. His name is Saul. He is a terrible king. So God raises up a young man who is a shepherd king. His name David. This is a picture of Jesus. This is now, he's going to do something new. He's going to restore worship, but he's also going to reform worship. And he's going to give a picture of what it's going to be like one day. And so here it comes. So David becomes king. And for seven years, he's locked out of Jerusalem. And for seven years, he waits until he's made king over all Israel when he can then take Jerusalem because he knew that God had chosen the city of Jerusalem, the city of peace, as an eternal dwelling place for himself. There was going to be a physical place, Jerusalem, but it would speak of a new Jerusalem, a garden city, that eternity would take place there. However, as we've spoken, you get me? So here was a temporary tent that was moving. Why? Because it needed to get to a permanent place called Jerusalem, which would prophesy of a new Jerusalem one day. All right. And David picked this up and he thought, ma, it's Jerusalem. But Jerusalem was locked up and it was tight. And they had the Jebusites that lived in a tower and no one was able to take the city of Jerusalem because the Jebusites held it as a stronghold. And David, when he became king of all Israel, he said, come on, we're going to go and take it. And what happened is they went up a water shaft. They must have swum deep into a well and a water that went into the tower. And they went from the inside and they completely um, surprised the Jebusites and they took the city of Jerusalem and David made it the place of worship. And so he decides now he's going to go down and get this ark. And so he goes down to Abinadab's house, and he says, Abinadab, what we need to do is we need to take this ark to its its permanent place, which is Jerusalem, the city of God, the city of peace. And Abinadab says, I'm with you. My sons are with you. Let's go. And so they go, like, how do we move this thing? And they go, well, the Philistines or the world moved it on a cart, so let's move it on a cart. And so they put a, this Ark of Covenant on a cart, put some cows in front, and away they're going. But not long into the journey, the ox stumbled, the cart stood, and one of the sons puts out to, to, to stop the Ark from falling. As he touches the Ark, he's killed immediately, dies there on the road. David is distressed. He goes, how could this be? I've killed somebody. He, he, he is distressed. So he just says, let's put this ark now in the nearest house. And Obed-Edom's house is chosen. And he puts it there because he goes, obviously we've done something that we should never have done. You can read it in 1 Chronicles. And you can see the, the history as it unfolds in Chronicles. And you see that what happens actually is that he goes and seeks the Lord and says, God, I've made a mistake. I've tr- Let me put it in our land. We've tried to move it in a world's way. It doesn't work. I want to move it in a better way. I want to move it with a kingdom way. How do we do it? And he goes back into the book, and he goes back into the Levitical way, and he sees the Levitical way of moving the ark was on the shoulders of priests and through sacrifice. So he goes, got it. So now he goes back, but he has to get the priests together, and he has to prepare it. And you can look in there in 2 Chronicles. Is it 2 or 1 Chronicles? Help me a little bit. Um, You see, 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles 15. I think this may come up. And it says, David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place. Say, prepared a place. Friends, I want to tell you that if you want to see the manifest presence in your life, you have to prepare a place. You have to prepare a permanent place. The presence of God wants to dwell within us. And sometimes there's um, the Jebusites and there's strongholds that are in our lives. It's not just about being born again, but it's about becoming free. 
And if you're struggling with freedom and you are bound and there is a stronghold that you're still facing, you can get freedom. And he said he prepared a place for the ark and he pitched a tent for it. Then David said, no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God. For the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. How's that? He got a revelation that you can't move the presence of God by the way of the world or by the way of religion. Religion doesn't move the presence of God. It shuts people out of the presence of God. But the relationship with Jesus will bring us into the presence of Almighty God. And it says, And David assembled all of Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark. And he said, down verse 12, Consecrate yourselves. Down in verse 13, he says, Because you did not carry it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not seek him according to his rule. Friends, when we get a whole Bible theology and we begin to seek God, I believe that as we find revelation, we'll find a way that will help us into the presence and into the manifest presence of God that will change everything. Verse 16, it says, David also commanded the chiefs of the Levites to appoint their brothers as singers. Say singers. Singers. Who should play loudly. Say loudly. loudly. No one ever come and tell me that the music in church is too loud. The Bible says play loudly. Uh oh. On musical instruments, on harps, lyres, cymbals, to raise sounds of what? Joy. 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 Woo! So David prepares a place in Jerusalem, this permanent place for God and his presence. He does it in the Levitical way. But now he says, restores worship, but then he reforms worship because now he adds singing. Uh, This is so important, and I want us to see this. I've said all of this so that you could understand this. Is that, I'm sorry, words fail me. But here in the garden, there was absolute perfection. They got shut out. There was a a Levitical form of worship that was inadequate, but it was being worked through. Moses, then comes David, and David restores what was lost, but he reforms what will come. David, who is a picture of Jesus, David was there. What he was doing is he was prophesying, he was speaking, he was restoring. He was reforming worship so that not only the blood of animals would allow us into the presence of of God, but praise and singing would usher us in, which is what we have today. And so let me show you in Hebrews chapter 13, it says that. Through him, then let us continually Offer up the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips that acknowledges his name. So what David did in in his reformation of worship is he established the singing, the praise of lips, the fruit of our lips, that one day that's what we would do instead of having to go through the blood of animals. Because why? Because Jesus Christ came and eternally, it says in in Corinthians, that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed, therefore we can keep the feast. In other words, Christ's eternal sacrifice was a once and for all. These, the blood of animals spoke to the time when Christ would give of his life so that then from then on we have absolute access. Hebrews chapter 4, let's go there quickly. Hebrews chapter 4 says, Since then we have a great high priest, a Levitical priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is un- unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but the one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace 
to help in a time of need. Friends, the access to God is open through the grace and faith of Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ. This is, the, this is the beauty, is that we could come in now through Jesus, but we need to have a better way of sacrifice, and that is singing praises to God, the fruit of our lips. And you go like, Craig, why the fruit of our lips? Well, the fruit of lips is, is what? What did you say? Words, yes. That's, I mean, yeah, we eat in, but when what comes out is words. Where do our words come from? A heart. A heart. <laughs> so worship has always been about a heart thing, isn't it? Because as the heart is, so the mouth speaks. So when we praise God, we're praising God from our heart. This is the fruit of lips. So back here, it was the fruit of soil that made a way. Today, it's the fruit of our lips, praise. And we look back and say, thank you, David, for restoring worship, but thank you, David, for reforming worship and showing us that through praise, through the musicians, through our exuberant praise, that we can usher in the praise of God. Hey, one more. Let's go to Psalm 100. You've got to bring your Bible, guys. I, I, the problem is, I can't give all the verses to these guys, so they're struggling at the back. It won't come up. It's just what it is. If you came with your Bible, you'd be able to read it right here. Bring your Bible. Say to your friend, bring your Bible. Bring your Bible. Come on, bring your Bible. Let's have a reformation. Bring your Bible. Bring your Bible. Should we read it together? Oh, it's not there. Make a joyful noise. Come on, let's, have, let's get the musicians up. Come, 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 musicians. Come on, come up here. Come up here. Can you find it? Can you get it? Can you put it up here? Is there any way you can do that in a minute? Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with? Singing. Come into his presence with? Singing. Come into his presence with? Singing. Oh, come on. Come into his presence with singing. Yeah. Know that the Lord is his God. He's the one who made us. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness is to all generations. This is what we're going to do in heaven or in that garden city. We're going to praise God woo, with singing. Why? Why is singing so important? Why is it that we can't just say it? There's a guy, I forget his name now. He says, why say it if you can sing it? And I don't, that's not theology. It's just, uh, I think the reason that God calls us to sing is that it, it means that we have to give our whole being to it. Your breath, your breathing. You see, the blood was life. In the blood, there's life. In our breath now is life. If you have no breath, you have no life. And so when we begin to sing, it means that we have to say the same words together, isn't it? What is the song? Give me a song. Holy, okay, let's do that. Holy, what is it? Holy, holy, are you Lord God Almighty? All right, stop there. What does it mean? We all had to, we had to say the same words. All right? So we have to be in unity around the words we say. Yep. The next thing we had to be on time, together, there's a... And then what else? You have to be in the same key. Some of us try. <laughs> you know what? If you can't sing, learn to sing. Come on. Why? Because it brings us into unity and agreement. When all our hearts begin to beat as one, when all our words are the same, when our harmony and key is in unity and agreement, 
as we begin to sing, something supernatural happens. This is what, when you sing, uh, uh, this, this will come up. Let me get it right. Those who are transformed by the Spirit sing. Can, I, can you put that up? I just want everyone to know that there's a day. No. There we go. Those who are transformed by the Spirit. Sing. Next line. Those who sing in the Spirit. Sing. No. Are transformed by a song. All right. Sorry, guys. I needed you to work with me there. Those who are transformed. Have you been transformed by the Spirit of God? Do you have the Spirit of God in you? Yeah. Yes. Then sing! Yeah. And then those who sing in the Spirit are transformed by the song. Oh, oh now you're about to get the thing. I'll go in the wrong key. Holy, holy, holy. Come on, let's stand. Stand. Are sing you, Lord God? I want to hear you. Oh, mighty. Come on, sing. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb, you are holy. Beautiful, beautiful. Holy. Now let your breath take. Are you Lord God Almighty? Now let your soul take. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy. And worthy is the Lamb. Come on. Because you are holy. incredible day here at Urban Life Church and you know there's a moment inside where Craig shared how as a church we've been praying and I um, mean they were seeking the Lord in the week and God revealed Isaiah 35 um, and I'm gonna read it for you because maybe you find yourself in this space today maybe you feel like you're in a barren place or there's a desert land and it says this Isaiah 35 verse 4 tell those who worry the anxious and fearful take strength have courage, there's nothing to fear. Look here, your God. Right here is your God. The balance is shifting. God will right the wrongs. None other than God will give you success and He's coming to make you safe. There's this beautiful moment in worship where Craig invited people forward and they began to come forward and they didn't know what was gonna happen, but. There were bunches of flowers and we began to hand out these flowers to people who felt like they were in a barren place. And in that moment, something broke, something shifted. And I believe that maybe you're watching this and you're going, I feel like I'm in a barren place. I feel like I'm in a wasteland or a desert land. And I wanna encourage you this morning that God is right there with you, that there is a breakthrough coming, that we're trusting for streams of living water to come and flow in your life. That, you know, where there is a, you feel like there is barrenness, God is gonna bring fruitfulness today. And so I wanna encourage you where you find yourself, go buy yourself a bunch of flowers. I know it sounds strange, but go buy a bunch of flowers. And every time you see those flowers, declare Isaiah 35 over your life. Declare that streams of living water are coming. Declare that the barren season has gone and the new has come. So I wanna encourage you with that today. And I wanna give you an opportunity, if that's you, Respond in this moment, write something in the comments, but take a moment with God to say, God, this is where I find myself, but I'm trusting that you're gonna come through for me. And we're trusting with you as a church. So I'd love to pray for you in this moment. 
Um, and I'm trusting that God is going to move, that manifest presence of God that we've been trusting for is going to come in your home, in your car, wherever you are today, whenever you listen to this. So God, I thank you. I thank you that you are close. I thank you that you are right there, that you are shifting things, that things are turning. And I thank you that they are going to be streams in the wasteland. God, I thank you that where there is desert and sun-scorched land, God, you are going to bring growth and fruitfulness and life and life in abundance, God. And we thank you that we can trust you, your manifest presence to move in people's lives today and whenever they hear this, in your holy name we pray, Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. We really love to have you a part of this and I want to encourage you, go to our Church Centre app, you can find out everything that's happening in the life of the church because hey, we'd love to connect with you and get to know you better. So have a beautiful week.